Good morning. It's your lucky day. Um, I've got 20 minutes to preach. So let's pray. We thank you, Lord, as we come to you this morning, that we can hear your word. And we do pray that you would open our hearts to receive your word for your glory. Amen. The title for the message this morning is The Love of Money. Today we're talking about a subject that is a difficult subject, um, the subject of money. It's a subject that is real in every single one of our lives here this morning. Um, It's a sensitive subject. It's a subject that for many has caused much pain. It's a subject that has caused for many much anxiety and stress. It is a subject that for many has caused even relationship breakdown. But perhaps what makes it such a difficult subject this morning more than anything else is that it really is a subject that exposes our hearts. There are few things that are a better barometer of our souls than money. So with that warning, let us dive in and read 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 10. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into many temptations, into a snare, and into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Well, you may recall from last week that Paul had been dealing with false teaching. um, And it seems strange that he suddenly jumps from verse 5, speaking about the false teachers, to to in verse 6, speak on the matter of wealth and possessions. Um, But as we commented last week, for one, um, as Paul ends in verse 5, speaking about how they, false teachers, imagine godliness as a means of gain, that one of the evidences of um, false teaching is the bad fruit in their lives. And often the bad fruit is that they are in it for not so much the help of others or the glory of God, but for their own personal gain. Many are in it um, to win it. Many are in it to make money. That's the bottom line. And we know all about that with TBN and Prosperity Gospel and a whole lot of stuff that we can be exposed to on YouTube. And so he exposes how often the test of a false teacher is that at the end their life is self-centered and and not God-centered. And the one thing that can expose that is their relationship to money, how they regard money. You want to spot a false teacher? You know, check out their bank accounts if you can. It'll say a lot. They imagine godliness as a means of gain. But secondly, I think the reality is, what Paul is wanting to do, is to distinguish between true godliness and and false godliness. Because the fact that many false teachers today have so many people following them must mean that they are doing something right, that they are getting away with their so-called agenda. And it is because people can get away with it by this um, deception that false um, that prosperity and blessing comes with God's favor and kindness. That it's a sign of God's you know, blessing in your life spiritually if you are um, blessed materially or, or physically. And I guess that they're not altogether wrong with thinking that. There is certainly an Old Testament precedent for material blessing matching God's favor. You see that in the Old Testament. There were many wealthy people in the Old Testament. In the law, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, um, God makes clear that if you obey me, you will be blessed. And that blessing was often described in terms of good crops and a good harvest and many children and, and such like. So it was often associated that if you were physically wealthy, it could have been an indication that it was because spiritually you were right with God. I mean, just think of the reign of Solomon, the height of the Old Testament kingdom, and what matched that was the greatest season of wealth and prosperity for the people of Israel. They had the temple. We know how wealthy Solomon was. We know how many wives he had. We know how 
um, blessed Israel were, how people were coming to the nation of Israel to see all their wealth. Even the Queen of Sheba came. And so there, is, there does seem to be a connection in the Old Testament between um, spiritual well-being and material well-being. So one could understand being mistaken to make that too much of a um, consistent um, uh, collaboration and people could think, well, yes, it is a sign of spiritual well-being if one is materially blessed. And so Paul has to say, but no, not necessarily. There is great gain in godliness with contentment, regardless of material wealth or possession, etc. Besides, think of Timothy, pastoring in a rich church, like Eph a, rich, a rich city like Ephesus. It was a center of trade and commerce and tourism. And so it's easy to be living in a culture like he was, like we live today in a consumer culture. We all live in, for the most part of us today, in an affluent, middle to upper class kind of setting. Um, and so with that, we can easily begin to associate money with and, and wealth and, and that kind of material prosperity with a standard way of life. And so it's easy for a leader to then think if he's going to have rapport and influence amongst the people, well, he too needs to match their lifestyle. And so God will surely bless him, make him become all things in order to become all things to everyone, as Paul said. And so there might have been a real temptation for Timothy to think that he's got to be wealthy in order to reach the people around him, um, to give him greater credibility, to give him some kind of spiritual advantage. But of course, we know too simply as well, as I mentioned in the very beginning, what a trap and temptation money is. And so if you're going to talk about the subject of godliness as... Um, uh, Paul brings up again at the end of verse 5. It is natural if, if he's going to speak about godliness further, that one of the issues that should come up immediately is the subject of money. I mean, Jesus himself spoke so much about money in his teaching. Think of the Sermon on the Mount, case in point, where he speaks about not worrying about what you will wear or what you will eat. Where he speaks about not storing up treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. Where he even shoots from the hip and says it straight by saying, you cannot serve both God and money. And certainly I don't have to tell you what your own heart is like and what my own heart is like. What the attraction of wealth and material things are for all of us. The new iPhone. The new Highlights Bucky. The new Garmin sports watch, the new K-Way jacket, the new Nike shoes. All of those things can grab our desires. And the truth is, whether it is the rich struggling with greed or the poor struggling with jealousy, money, wealth, and materialism pulls on all of our hearts. That's why he must deal with it. John makes it explicitly clear in his first letter in 1 John chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. You see, money feeds all those things, doesn't it? The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's like, it's like this, um, uh, this green smoke when, when it comes to material things. And its effect on us. That, that, that we see something and this green smoke begins to waft over us. And begins to encircle us. And then begins to penetrate our hearts. And it kind of gets us in this entranced spell. Where we think we must have. We must have. And our consumer instant gratification culture. Wow what a terrible culture we live in today. In fact we steeped in it only makes the whole situation worse. So surely, in speaking about godliness, we must speak about money and possessions as Paul does here. Because it is one area that we're all bound to struggle with. And so Paul helps us here to rightly and wisely deal with this inescapable reality of money and possessions, etc. in our lives. And so in the 15 minutes that remain, two big truths that Paul highlights for us here to keep us godly in a world of money. That's the question. How are we going to keep godly in a world of money? 
Well, the first is the joy of less that he speaks about in verses 6 to 8. And the second is the danger of more that he speaks about in verses 9 to 10. Firstly, the joy of less. You notice that he calls us to contentment in verses 6 to 8. He speaks about contentment in verse 6. And he speaks about being content at the end of verse 8. And so he's encouraging us to be content. And he does it by, by reminding us in this passage what real gain is, on one hand, what, what really is gain in life, and secondly, what possessions really are, how much they are really worth. And, and so what we're going to see is he gives us, as we, as we seek to be content, as we seek to understand the joy of less, he, he gives us a, a spiritual perspective on life on one hand, reminding us of that. And on the other hand, he gives us an eternal perspective on life. That those two realities feed into our hearts to make us content. Firstly, notice how he draws our attention immediately to a spiritual perspective on life. Where he says that there is great gain in what? In gold? No, in godliness. That's where our gain lies. It is in not physical wealth, but in spiritual growth. That's what true gain is. That's what really is valuable, is spiritual growth, not physical wealth. In other words, it's, he, he's encouraging us to actually see what matters more than anything else is, is spiritual maturity. That, that as we grow spiritually, that that really is gain, that that really is worth something. That, that if you're going to be investing in different things in your life, make sure you are investing in your spiritual life. Way over and above the stock markets and shares and property and cars and clothes. Make sure you're investing in your spiritual well-being. That's what he's saying. I mean, our Christian life is about so much more. And this physical world creates a spiritual haze that makes us forget that. Um, our, our Christian life is about something so much bigger. As these following verses make clear for us. Matthew 16. Then Jesus told his disciples... If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Two Corinthians chapter five for the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that, that one has died for all. Therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him. Who for their sake died and was raised. In Romans 8, 28 to 29. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Do you see what those verses are saying? It's saying our life is not just about following Jesus, but it is that now. Our life is not just about living for Jesus, which it is also now. But much more than that, our lives, in fact, are about becoming like Jesus. That's the goal. Is our spiritual maturity is being conformed to the image of Christ. Not to the standard of living in our consumer culture. That's not the goal. To match the Joneses. Or the Smiths. Or whoever else they might be. Lucky for them. No, it's, it's, it's to be conformed to the image of Christ, which immediately makes godliness a, a, an essential part of our lives. It's not peripheral. That's what Paul is getting at. That godliness with contentment is great gain. And so the question is, do we really, do we really believe that? You know, like, do we really see that godliness is really more valuable than gold? And so what's the test? 
Well, the test is where are we investing our time and our energy and more in physical wealth or more in spiritual growth? That's the question. Notwithstanding that we have to spend eight hours a day at work, some less, some more. Which is part of your own spiritual growth, as we heard from Devon. The way you work and how you work matters much more than what work you do. It's about deliberately seeking to be growing, consciously working at it. We've got to have that spiritual perspective on life in order to be content. But secondly, he, he says not only a spiritual perspective, but also this eternal perspective. That we need to realize that it is what is to come that matters. It is what is in heaven that will last forever. That by contrast, what is now in terms of material and physical possessions are temporary. What did he say? He says, naked what, what naked we came and, and, and naked we will go. For we brought nothing, verse 7, into this world and we cannot take anything out of this world. Everything we own here is but temporary. It is not going to last. Job speaks about it. Ecclesiastes speaks about it. John Stott puts it like this. So our life on earth is a brief pilgrimage between two moments of nakedness. We brought nothing with us and we can take nothing away with us. I mean, just think of that. Nothing of what we have now, what we've been chasing after, is going to matter at all. Not an item of clothing, not an item of technology, not an item of transport, not an overseas holiday, not a, not a rugby game that we attend, not a concert we attend. None of that's going to mean anything. More so, not only is it fleeting here today, gone tomorrow, but we all know how easily things break, how easily things wear out, how easily things get lost, like car keys and glasses. How easily things get stolen. And everything that we have accumulated in this life stays behind when we die. We don't take anything with us. Even those who bury their favorite bottle of wine and wear their favorite suit into their coffin, it rots. It goes no further. When Rockefeller died, um, someone asked his lawyer, so how much did he leave behind? And the lawyer answered very correctly, all of it. <laughs> all of it. That's the answer. And so we are reminded today that we need to keep an eternal perspective on life. But the world tells you no. The world says to us, we need it all now. That this is where your happiness lies. This is where your identity is. This is where your status is. This is where your security is found. But it's all lies. It's all lies and yet we covet and yet we want. And yet Paul says in verse 8, But we, if we have food, he dispels all that. He, he shoots through that like an arrow, like a hot knife through butter. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Incredible. He is saying that having food and clothes, in other words, having our basic needs met, being able to live and survive, that that is enough. That that is enough. We need nothing more. In fact, that, that anything extra materially in our lives should be seen as bonus. So if that's what Paul is saying, if that is true, then our problem may not be that we don't have enough money. Our problem may be that our standard of living is too high. Because what Paul is saying, that if we've got more than food and clothes, well, well then what? Then we are rich. Then we are blessed. We really are. If we have food and clothes, with that, we shall be content. And so contentment is, is the answer. And, and the way to, to, to satisfy our hearts in which is food and clothes, as it were, is to keep a spiritual perspective that godliness matters and to keep an eternal perspective that nothing here actually lasts. That is the step to the joy of less. The second point is the danger of more, which we don't have time to deal with this morning. But all that Paul simply says and makes clear is that on the other hand, if you are seeking more and more and more, you are only going to be filling your life with more trouble, with temptation and bondage and destruction. And that, not that money is evil, by no means. 
The point here is not to say that, that poverty is better than wealth. No. The point here is to say that contentment is better than covetousness. That's the point. Because when all is said and done, the crux of the matter is this, for us as Christians, is what are we living for? That's what's really been tested here. That's, that's what it comes down to, is what is really in our hearts. You know, Jesus said those powerful words when he said that what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his soul? I mean, th that is such an important question to ask ourselves as we consider what are we living for. That is the test. Are we really living for the life to come or are we really living for now? Because if we are living for now, if we are banking our identity and our security on our wealth, on our jobs, on our career success, on having certain um, uh, spirit, financial um, successes, and yet we forfeit our souls. We spend a life of luxury here, but we spend an eternity of destruction in hell. And so... Let us guard against imagining that godliness. That let us let, let us let, let us not imagine that godliness without contentment. No. The lights have gone off and now it's distracted me. <laughs> Can hardly even read my notes here. And so the question is, what are we living for? Do we love God or do we love the benefit God, God brings to us? John Piper writes, Covetousness is desiring something so much that you lose your contentment in God. And so the opposite of covetousness is contentment in God. In other words, what it means to believe in Jesus is to experience Him as the satisfaction of my soul's thirst and my heart's hunger. In other words, faith is the experience of of contentment in Jesus. And so the final question, I guess, is simply this. So does the way we use money, so does the way we use money show that God and not money is our greatest treasure? So Lord, we come to you today recognizing we all need your word today in our hearts. We all need you to, by your Spirit, encourage us towards greater contentment and to deliver us from covetousness. How I pray, O oh God, that you would make yourself our great treasure and our great delight. That we would see that you are enough over and above food and clothes. You are enough. You always have been and, and, and always will be. Make us such people, O oh God, who have hearts of, of generosity Make us such people who, yes, by the way we use our money, show that God and not money is our greatest treasure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.